Venerable members of the Sangha, dear friends, let me begin by thanking the organizers of this seminar and especially Dr. Susanta Gurutilaka and Hema Gurutilaka for having invited me to make this presentation on Anagarika Dharmapala and the Buddhist revival. We know that Anagarika Dharmapala played the biggest role in the development of Buddhism, the propagation of Buddhism in the modern world. But very few people realize how he began to play this role and what a great sacrifice he made for the sake of both our nation and the religion. He met Colonel Olcott and Madame Blavatsky on their arrival in Gaul in 1880 and he was a young man of barely 16 years of age and the presence of these two people who have come all the way from USA to embrace Buddhism and to work for Buddhism made a very big impact on his life. So much so that when he had a job in the education department as a junior clerk, he was very interested in going to Adyar to learn more about Theosophy. Everybody objected. The parents were unhappy that a young boy should be wanting to go all the way to Madras, which is the, as Chennai was then called, and then be associated with Colonel Olcott and Madame Blavatsky. But one thing good happened as a result of this. Madame Blavatsky explained to him that he had a role within his own religion rather than in theosophy. She asked him to study Pali and Buddhism and he took that advice and began to read widely and to a great extent he was convinced that he had a role to play in the promotion of Buddhism. He began by convincing his parents that he wanted to dedicate his life not to a job, not to be a economically viable. Or he only wanted five rupees a month from them so that he could lead a life completely unattached to worldly things and promote his ideas with regard to spirituality. This so happened that while he was working and he was also prepared for the clerical examination and uh, he read in the newspapers that Colonel Olcott was completely dissatisfied with the kind of support that he got for his work on Buddhist education. As all of you know, Colonel Olcott came to Sri Lanka with the idea of promoting Buddhism and theosophical ideas for which he had been responsible in both USA and in India. Then of course Gurgaon was their center near Bombay. The, he had been very dissatisfied with the kind of support that the people in Sri Lanka were giving him and he wrote here I am, but people are ready to come and accompany me to the villages only during weekends. You cannot do the work that I am planning just for the two days of the weekend. I need somebody who can come with me, translate and let the people know what we are trying to do and that support has not come to me so I am leaving the country. He thought he would give up his job and go to Colonel Orcutt and say, Here I am. You don't have to leave. I will be with you. This exposure to what Colonel Orcutt had as his vision for 
the promotion of Buddhism and the personal knowledge that young Don David as he was called and later changed his name to Anagarika Dharmapala realized when he saw the villagers, the people, the very poor conditions in which they lived, he had two missions in his life cut out for him. He wanted to promote Buddhism in which he was greatly interested and he also wanted to bring about a national revival so that the country would emerge from his status as a colonial outpost of the British and develop into an independent country. So there are two missions that he had dedicated his life to and it worked extremely well in both areas. But the most important thing happened to him when he went in 1891 as a young man of 27 to Buddha Gaya. He was horrified to see that the place where the Buddha was enlightened was not in the control of the Buddhists. It has been handed over to Mahant, who was a Hindu dignitary, and it, the, even the place where, where the main shrine had been used for animal sacrifices. And he thought, this is a very sacred place. Buddha was enlightened at this place, Buddha Gaya, the Bodhi tree. And he wanted to go to the world and say, let us save Buddha Gaya. As the people in Sri Lanka would remember, Buddha Gaya, our Bera Ganyu, was the slogan with which he established the Mahabodhi Society. The Mahabodhi Society, when it was established, no one thought the outreach that he had in mind. It turned out to be the world's first ever international Buddhist forum. He attracted to his mission the greatest Buddhist leaders of the world. Among the patrons was the Dalai Lama of Tibet, the Mikado or the Emperor of Japan and many more dictatories in the world. And the Mahabodhi Society began with Venerable Hikadwe Sri Subangala as the president and he assumed that Anagarika Dharapala assumed the role of the general secretary. But he was the life wire behind it. His worldwide network spread very rapidly and branches of the Mahabodhi were established in all continents at that time. Now the importance of the Mahabodhi society and the international nature that it assumed can be understood if you know that in that particular period Buddhism was hardly known in the world. The British, the English readers knew about the life of Buddha from Sir Edwin Arnold's book, the poem Light of Asia, and that was published in 1879. And Colonel Olcott, under the direction of Venerable Hikad Vesri Sumangala, wrote the Buddhist Catechism, which within 10 years went into 40 editions. And these were the two books by which anyone in the world could know what Buddhism was. And Anakarika Dharupala took this as a challenge for him. And what he did was, as one of the important work of, works of the Mahabodhi Society, was to publish an eight-page journal called the Mahabodhi Journal. The Mahabodhi journal, though it was only eight pages, because of the network that he had developed reached various parts of the world, and the organizers of the first 
Parliament of World Religions in Chicago in 1893, Dr. Barrows in particular, read this and realized that there was a promising Badin Buddhist leader who must be associated with this work. Now, as a result, he was invited to the world, uh, Parliament of World's Religions and he came in 1893 as a very young person who is not used to meeting an international crowd of that nature but with a determination that he had a message to deliver. And the speech he made was the world's debt to the Buddha. It covered all aspects of Buddhism. It covered Buddhist teachings, Buddha's teachings. It covered the various aspects of the ethical message that Buddhism had incorporated and the bit of the culture that Buddhism has promoted. And that turned out to be a very comprehensive presentation and is so important that very recently when the Duke University in USA wanted to publish a Sri Lankan reader so that the people could have uh, some idea of all aspects of Sri Lanka's culture and politics and so on, asked me whether this particular speech could be taken from my publication Return to Righteousness and included in their reader because they thought even today it is relevant and it is the kind of document which can be a very good introduction to Buddhism that any single person has written. Now what happened is that he would also make a mark in the general discussion. There was a session which was dedicated to how the missionaries could improve their work of conversion of people who are not Christians in the world. And he made a very, very sharp statement in that meeting. He said, let missionaries come to our countries, but let them bring not their wine drinking, meat eating culture, but let them come. Meek as Jesus himself. If they come to us with the example of Jesus, we welcome them. And that speech made a very big impact, not only with the meeting, but the media in USA. That was the first most important step that Anagatka Dharmapala could take in taking Buddhism to the world. Now, this particular visit was a great encouragement to people who were experimenting with Buddhism, who were trying to learn Buddhism in USA. According to the contemporary evaluations of the, his speeches as well as his contacts, in the USA, I think you could easily say that if anybody has taken Buddhism formally into a world forum, it was Anagarga Dharupada. He had many supporters in USA as a result of it. And eventually in Britain itself. Right through his life, the people who were interested in Buddhism found in him the support that they were looking for. And one of those who was very convinced that she had a role to play in what Anagarika Dharmapala's mission was Mary Foster, a lady in Honolulu who was convinced that Tanagarka Dharmapala's work was relevant to the modern world and financially supported him in all his projects. 
In his writings, he gives great credit to the support that she had given him and the encouragement that came from him. Now let's come closer to what he did with his Mahabodhi society. Mahabodhi society had more than one mission in mind. His program, which was very ambitious, included things like setting up a Buddhist university open to all the traditions of Buddhism in Buddha Gaya. While it was not possible for him to reach all that he had in mind, he made people organize themselves in India to receive Buddhism back again. Olcott supported him at the beginning and there were three aspects of the work that they did in India. The first was to see whether Indians could be made proud of the fact that India, if it ever had any prestige in the world, if it had a reputation in the world, if it had any fame in the world, it all came as a result of the Buddha. Most Indians did not at that time realize that Buddhism was known for 2000 years or more in the entirety of the Asian continent. We have Buddhist remains from as west as Bulgaria and going as east as Philippines and from north from Russia and Mongolia right down to Indonesia and the Maldive Islands. To Indians, they realized that Buddha had made India better known than anyone else and better appreciated as the home of spirituality. This made many Indian members of the intelligentsia to take an interest in Buddhism and be his supporters. The second front that he developed was that the Buddhist shrines of India where the Buddha had been personally associated with were not properly maintained. They are not in the area that the pilgrims went and that the Buddhist nature of these shrines was not apparently known. But he took Buddhism back to India. And this is the main contribution that he made to India and this was told by Sunita Kumar Chatterjee in 1952. Ashoka made India indebted to Sri Lanka and Anagarka Dharmapala paid it back. And this he did in Sri Lanka through his Sengal about there and he then got to, to Karuno and he was a, the one who promoted promoted the Buddhist monks of Sri Lanka to take a great interrogator interest in Buddhism. This is a subject on which I could talk for hours, but with the 20 minutes that you have allotted for me, I want you to read what I have written. Over 50 years I have written a lot on Anagarika Dharmapala, which are all at your disposal. And this is my plea in the 150th birth anniversary of Anagarika Dharmapada, let us carry on the mission in all fronts in which he had inherited to us. Thank you.